Welcome to Agatha Christie, She Watched, our spoiler-heavy look at the movie and TV adaptations of the mystery genre's greatest writer. I'm Bill Peschel of Peschel Press, publishers of the annotated novels of Agatha Christie, and today we'll be talking about master criminals, conniving sisters, gullible young men, and a cute pug. It's The Lavers of Hercules, the 2013 Poirot episode starring David Suchet as Hercule Poirot. But first, let me introduce my partner in marriage, as well as crime of the fictional kind, Teresa Peschel. Teresa, how are you doing today? Hi, Bill. <laughs> I'm always so thrilled to be here with you in your little bitty office under the stairs. And yes, it is special when I come down for the podcast, as opposed to usually when I just come down and interrupt you and say, I need X, <laughs> fill in the blank. <laughs> Which I know you don't try to do very often. No, so. I do try. I, you I do, do only try when to avoid necessary. that. Only when necessary. So I do try to keep it to, uh, you know, only a few times a day so that you can get your. <laughs> work done. But before we get started, I do want to remind everyone that uh, we always have lots of events coming up. If you want to meet us in person, just go to our website, specialpress.com, and on the front page on the right-hand side is a list of our upcoming events. As we record this, it is Thursday, the 8th of September. I don't know when uh, anybody's going to be listening to this, but we do have a couple of Saturdays coming up where we're going to be at Books, Books, Books in Lancaster on the 17th of September, 2022. Then we're going to be at the Carlisle Art Show in Carlisle, Pennsylvania on Saturday, the 24th of September. And we're going to be at the Chocolate Town Book Festival in downtown Hershey, a big book festival. And that's on Saturday, the 1st of October. And then we're going to be at Cozy Con, sponsored by the Mechanicsburg Mystery Bookshop. And that is Saturday, the 8th of October in 2022. So we do have things coming up. So if you want to meet us in person and talk about Agatha Christie, take a look at our website. Now we're going to talk about The Labors of Hercules. 12 stories published in 1947 as a short story collection. And the conceit was that Poirot, finally after 25 years uh, after retiring from the Belgian police force, is deciding to retire. But he wants to do 12 big cases that would be his swan song, you might say. Yes, his doctor suggested it suggested the labors of Hercules or was talking about Hercules and he read up on it and was just appalled at uh, <laughs> the completely dysfunctional uh, Hercules and the Greek gods and uh, how these people behaved and no method in order whatsoever. But he started doing cases that struck his fancy. It's a really interesting collection of short stories. They're wildly varied. They have very little to do with each other. The, what connects them is the conceit of following along in the path of Hercules and his 12 labors. Other than Miss Lemon, who pops up once in a while, there's only one character in the various short stories that you meet twice, and that's Amy Carnaby, who is an older woman on hard times. She's become a companion, which means essentially a paid, a, paid, a paid friend. friend. A paid friend, and it was how you handled upper class women who had no money and no way of supporting themselves and she's a very clever woman and she's again in a way like miss lemon she would make a great detective on her own she is invisible very clever and an older woman so nobody looks at her twice and when i read the stories for the agatha project i had no idea they were going to adapt that because the stories have so little to do with each other other than the overarching theme but in terms of actual connective tissue like this story feeds into that story feeds into that story and there's an overall arc and you get a big climax no, nothing like that. So structurally, the movie is different from the other episodes because you have essentially three main stories. Interweaving, yes. And they kind of interweave and you have the only connective tissue between them is that the character from one story becomes involved with the characters from another story. I was really impressed with how well the scriptwriter handled the labors because, as I said, the 12 stories have nothing to do with each other. Poirot travels around. He uh, he even goes to Ireland. That's for the apples of Hesperides. He travels to Switzerland. He uh, travels up and down England. He does a lot of traveling for this. And you think, how are you going to turn these 12 stories into a movie when some of the stories would have been an hour-long episode by themselves, a very nice hour-long episode, and some of the longer ones could have been a full-fledged 90-minute movie 
And I did not get the feeling, sometimes what happens in Hollywood is they'll take a big complicated story or several novels, uh, I'm thinking particularly of Lemony Snicket, where they tried to cram the first four novels into one movie and it was just a mess. And I was expecting a mess. And it worked! It worked great! And they really they, they worked in references to most of the stories, most of the labors. Uh, not all of them. I think the Apple's was uh, omitted completely because I don't remember seeing any chalices, but they worked in a lot of references. It all held together pretty well, I thought. Yeah, the the main story is from the Ermanthian Boar. Yes. Which and is about this hunt for a master criminal, Myra Scout. They started in London at this party being thrown by uh, this minister. Somebody important in the British government. Let's just leave it at that. The Lady Lucinda is wearing these incredible diamonds, something that Marie Antoinette would have been proud to wear, these incredible diamonds and diamond earrings. And she's afraid because everybody knows that Mariscond is not just a jewel thief and an art thief. He murders his victims with joy. And the implication is that if he kills you, he is not going to do it quick and clean where he cuts your throat or he garrots you and it's over in a couple of minutes. No, if he has the time, he's going to take his time and make Make sure you really suffer because that's the kind of person that he is. So she's afraid. She's dressed up. She's in this mob of people. And yet she she senses her impending doom. And she is not wrong. You can almost see the plot mechanisms springing into uh, life. She tells Poirot how f fearful she is. And he says, not to worry, my dear. I will protect you. You are surrounded by police, including a nice policewoman who will be able to follow you into the ladies' room when you go to powder your nose. Well, and, she'll stand outside the ladies' room, and then you knock on the door in a certain manner, you know. And, and he demonstrates this in a crowd of people. Bad security here. This is this is bad operational security. <laughs> and, and let me say a couple of words here about security. Good security is intrusive. It is a pain in the ass. You really have to pay attention because you have to be right every time. You can't afford to make a mistake terrorists or master criminals who are listening in in the crowd they have a bigger field of operation in which to be right you have to close off every single entrance but they only have to find one but you don't know which one they're going to find wrapping out your secret knock on the, ban the banister. banister railing over a balcony in a great big space so it can echo throughout the space and i know there's crowd noise if the criminal is anywhere near and is going to be paying attention to hercule poirot they're going to hear it. Right. And they do. This is a, a staple of mysteries in which they set a trap at a party for the master jewel thief and art thief in and this art case. Thief. And how he found the time, I do not know. <laughs> because one of the prizes is a painting of Hercules doing, I can't remember which one. Is it the Nemean lion? He's, no, it was the killed, Hydra. The Hydra. It was slaughtering the Hydra. The Hydra. Of, Classical and, painting. Apparently, the thief is stealing all the 12 labors, paintings depicting the 12 labors. Yeah, they have some artist named Van Droys, who I do not know if that is a real person or not. It probably, it may be, it may not. It's a series of 12 paintings depicting the 12 labors of Hercules, one painting per labor. And Mariscond is stealing all of them so that he can then sell the entire set of 12 to one incredibly rich but criminally minded patron who will buy them and put them on display in his private gallery and not show them to anybody because they're all stolen. And at the same time, Mariscond also steals, in addition to art, he steals jewels. But as I said earlier, he is not just a thief, he is a murderer, somebody who, a sadistic murderer, somebody who really takes pleasure in this. And the, apparently, uh, when he murders Lucinda, I don't know how he found the time. This is one of those magical things where uh, somehow during the party, the thief manages to murder the police constable dressed as a footman in front of the painting, cut the painting out of the frame on the wall, roll it up, shove it into a pocket, and then trot upstairs to the ladies' room where Lucinda is, do the uh, knock three times, get inside. It sounds like she disemboweled her cut her throat and then cut her abdomen, slashed it open so all her internal organs all over the place, also murders the policewoman who is guarding the door, and then slips away with not a drop of blood on their evening wear. Uh, sure, you got all that done in like three minutes, right? 
Very efficient. <laughs> very, very efficient. But this is Hollywood for you. Something would be much louder, much noisier, and might take a lot longer. Reminds me of one of the Jack the Ripper killings. It was the, the double event in which he kills one prostitute, but didn't have enough time to disembowel it. So he goes down, and this is literally the timetable is like only within 15 to 20 minutes. He, he walks like half a mile to Mitre Square and spends his time with another prostitute. That is in a square, this little area, enclosed area that is on the constable's beat. And the constable comes across the body while it is still warm and missed Jack by literally a minute or two. And you get that kind of event that embeds itself in the public consciousness. And it's small wonder that you can come up with these master criminals who can be just as efficient because you see that one incident in real life and it just becomes Ew. part of the vernacular oh yeah <laughs> i won't even tell you i won't tell you more I, about I, that I but you heard, get the, the idea I, I, I have heard that some of the crime scene photos of jack the ripper are so gruesome that even today they don't rev they, they don't make them publicly available because hardened criminal investigators who have seen god knows everything still recoil yeah the the, the last one was particularly vicious but moving on so we <laughs> Back to Poirot. And, <laughs> and away from Jack the and Ripper. away from the Jack the Ripper. That's the setup. So the rest of the episode takes place, and this is from, like I said, the Amanthian Born, which Poirot, well, there's an interlude, actually, which sets it up, and that's from the... The Arcadian Deer. The Arcadian but, Deer. But it's also, this is where they work in the Doctor at the very beginning of the, the series. Poirot is naturally devastated. He didn't protect Lucinda. He didn't keep the diamonds from being stolen. He didn't keep the painting from being stolen. And policemen and a policewoman laid down their lives, as well as Lucinda. They all died, and there may have been more, but we don't know. Certainly Mariscond has a reputation for leaving bodies littering in his wake. So we know that there are plenty of people that he He's killed. He got away with it, got away clean, and Poirot is left holding the bag and feeling immense guilt because he had just told Lady Lucinda, I will protect you. He's feeling very depressed. He's talking to his doctor. His doctor says, it's not physical, it's mental. What you need is a good case to shake you out of this, to realize that you are still a wonderful detective and you've done wonderful things. You know, this is a bump in the road, a big bump because you're bumping over a couple of bodies, but... <laughs> When you balance this against all of the wonderful, good things that you have done, the criminals you have unmasked, sometimes you lose. And so he suggests a good case, but Poirot doesn't want to listen, and he is so depressed, and he doesn't want to go walk. And so he ends up driving out with uh, chauffeur. Uh, the chauffeur from the agency, and the chauffeur takes him to this simply gorgeous conservatory in a gorgeous garden, Scion House Conservatory, apparently. In, in London. If you don't live in, in the UK, but if you live in central Pennsylvania, you can get kind of a feel for what this looks like by visiting Longwood Gardens. That kind of a conservatory with that kind of formal gardens and splashing fountains. And wow, it's amazing what you can do with armies of gardeners and unlimited money. And why don't we have our edges like that? But anyway, uh, so he meets the, the Ted Williams, the chauffeur. Ted, As in the story of the Arcadian deer, he breaks down and tells Poirot about this girl he met, he was the driver for the and for a he, ballerina for a ballerina, and he met the ballerina's maid Nita, and this is something that they didn't spell out in the episode, but in the story, the ballerina's name is Nita, but the story tells you why she called herself that. It's short for incognita. Ted Williams falls madly in love with this girl, and apparently she with him, and they see each other during the course of ballerina oh. Katrina's stay in London. When and she's, you know, the toast of London on every stage. And then she says, I can't see you anymore. And I have to go off to Switzerland with my mistress. That's it. That's it. And he's absolutely bereft, bereft enough that he sobs in front of a stranger in front of a fountain in this absolutely gorgeous garden that nobody should be unhappy in because it is so beautiful. Ted Williams' grief speaks to Poirot and he says, I will help you. And the only clue that he has to go on is the brochure 
for this fancy hotel and spa in the Alps, and he goes off to the Alps, and quite by accident, he's waiting at the funicular station, and there's a French police inspector there, Inspector Lemontil. Lemontil, something like that, who recognizes him instantly. He's pretending to be the clerk at the funicular office, and they have a whispered conversation about, oh my God, you're here for Mariscon? What? He's here? Yes, that's what we've been told. And so Poirot ends up on the trail of Mariscond again, completely by accident. And then there's another coincidence which happens in which as he's going up in the funicular on the one cab going down, he sees Countess Vera Rusakov, the one who got away, his Irene Adler, although let us not forget the young lady in uh, the chocolate box who gave him the boutonniere vase. One of the interesting tidbits that comes out of uh, watching all of the 70-some Poirot episodes one after another is we didn't have years in between episodes where we forget details like this. In the chocolate box, he met this lovely young lady named Virginie, and she gave him the boutonniere vase, and he also loved her, but he was not ready to leave the police force, and she married the nice chemist. And now she has children, and she's a happy person with, with a happy family, which he does not have. So when you see Vera, she is not the only one who got away. There are two, but there she is, and they, their eyes meet. Countess Vera heading down the mountain, and Poirot heading up the mountain, and alas... Will they meet again? Well, of course they do. And of course they this do. This is a Poirot episode. Not only do we meet her, but we meet her daughter as well, Alice Cunningham. Countess Vera tells Poirot that with a mother like her, because she is, after all, a noted jewel thief and person of low morals, low moral standards in terms of other people's property, but her daughter would either be absolutely following the straight and narrow or a worse master criminal and this is a very nice setup for the ending when you discover that countess vera recognizes her own daughter even though she didn't know it even though apparently she didn't know after we watch the episode bill and i always go out and walk we discuss the film that we have just seen and we argued about a line that i still think should have been said but bill is telling me it's too on the nose but i don't care Sometimes we just agree to disagree. And fortunately, let's face it, if we have to disagree about something, you know, something that has nothing to do with who did the dishes <laughs> or why didn't you uh, uh, take out the trash, is, is it's very acceptable. I'm willing, I can live with this. Yes, this is easy. This, this is an easy disagreement. <laughs> it's a writing disagreement. It's well, a but, writing disagreement. It's a, it's a fan disagreement. But anyway, so as Poirot's riding up in the funicular, he also notices... Harold Waring. Harold Waring was a young man and the assistant undersecretary to an important minister at that big fancy ball where Lady Lucinda wore the diamonds and got disemboweled. And he had to go off and hide from gossip because, oh my God, he fathered an illegitimate child. Although, of course, as it turns out, it wasn't him. But there's Harold also on the funicular. He has to get away to someplace remote. And so, of course, he ends up at the same place as Poirot and Mariscond. <laughs> And as he's riding up in the funicular, there's also two ladies, younger and older, and the younger one keeps casting him a sly, sideways, flirtatious glance and then immediately looks down. Oh, I shouldn't have looked at you, you handsome young man. I shouldn't have looked at you. I should pretend I don't see you. This is when we discover that it is a Mrs. Clayton is the younger woman and a Mrs. Rice is her mother. There is a Mr. Clayton, but we don't see him because he stays in the hotel room drinking and abusing Elsie. Yes, to loud effect. I mean, you wonder. You're, you're, and wonder again, about, this is weird because when I think about it now, we're looking at a castle. This is a castle on a Swiss Alp, and yet the walls apparently are made of paper so that you can hear in room 16, you can hear somebody in room 10 screaming. And I mean, I know that if you're screaming, the voices carry, but still, we're talking about a castle in Switzerland, and I would think that they had better construction when that castle was built because they were using a lot of stone, which helps muffle the walls. And those interior partition walls must be made out of paper. That could be, but they were also pointing uh, the camera at the sinks as well, so it's going through the plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> really? That, I saw that, that too, well. and I'm thinking, really? <laughs> really? 
But just go with it, folks. They yeah. have to have Poirot listening in and they have to have Harold Waring listening in because Harold has to, of course, as a noble hero in training, he has to rescue the damsel from the abusive husband because he just can't stand by and watch some pretty young woman be abused, be screamed at, and he sees the bruises on her face. And there's a, one lovely scene in the hallway where apparently uh, Mr. Clayton is dead drunk and asleep, he, and Clayton knocks on the door and has a brief conversation with Elsie and says, if you say you're fine, I'll go away. And she says, I'm fine. And, and then, then she kisses she him. She kisses him. <laughs> and all I can think is, he was thinking with the head on his shoulders, instead of, oh my God, I get to rescue this damsel. He would have thought, if she was really an abused wife, she is not going to be kissing a complete stranger in a hotel hallway. <laughs> But, you know. but again, this is movie shorthand. So here we are. Of course, Poirot discovers that Katerina, the ballerina, is there and she has this mysterious doctor. Her, her, her doctor with doctor her is Lutz. apparently some kind of a psychologist. And uh, well, maybe it sounds like he knows the lingo. He's disparaging Jung because, of course, everybody is a Freudian. But that doesn't mean that he really is a doctor. And then there is another person at the hotel. That is Schwartz, who is apparently a man about town and very well well dressed and it turns out he's an insurance adjuster and then you discover he's the embedded policeman then there's the waiter gustav who's oro thinks is lieutenant drews but it turns out that he's not and of course the person the other person to watch out for is the hotel concierge francesco who is a corrupt man and very cheerful and friendly about it too yeah he, do, he does favors for money he does favors for money. That's what he's there for. And all of these disparate threads tie together. Oh, and of course, there's Alice Cunningham, which is, you know, Countess Vera's daughter is there. And as I said earlier, Countess Vera knew enough about her own daughter to recognize that her daughter would go one of two ways. She would either follow the straight and narrow, which is the image that she prevent, presents to Poirot and to the world of being this intensely interested in the psychology of criminals and criminals should be punished. And she wants to know all about it to make sure that they get what they deserve or that her daughter would become a master criminal, but far worse than Vera because Countess Vera, whatever you can say about her, never murdered anyone. And so all of these threads start playing together. And then we have the avalanche, which closes off the funicular. That's right. So they are like in, um, and then there are none. none. They're trapped. <laughs> <laughs> or on the Orient Express, when the snow closes down the railway, you're trapped. You're trapped. And it's it's just like in the original story, except in their case, it was the funicular was disabled by possibly by the criminals. So there's that little tension getter as well that that the, the criminals deliberately disabled the funicular for at least a couple of days so that they could do whatever their nefarious purposes are. So here nature in, intervened here instead. It is a little bit complicated. I think a second viewing would make all of the, the parts fit together more neatly. The first viewing, it's almost overwhelming. There's just so much. You start with the huge party where Lady Lucinda is wearing the jewels and you have all of these really well-dressed extras standing around dancing and singing and waving their champagne glasses and the, the theft of the painting and then Poirot torn apart over it and then talking to his shrink and then meeting the chauffeur and then suddenly there he is on the funicular heading up the Alps and then he sees Countess Vera on the way down and that's when he runs back into Harold again and Elsie Clayton and her mother and then you get up to the, the top of the mountain and you meet Francesco and the rest of the staff, including the one who is a disguised police sergeant, or at least that's who Poirot thinks, plus the suspicious guest, plus the ballerina, plus Alice, plus the ballerina's suspicious shrink, and yet it all still fit. It, it all tied together very yeah, well. Yeah, I thought it tied together very well. Sometimes a little bit, a little too tight when it turns out that Katrina's shrink is not a shrink, and you think, oh, of course he's not going to be a shrink, because uh, why would he want his meal ticket to get better? And then you find out that it isn't just that he's a fake shrink, but he is also Mariscon's fence. There's a change from the story because in the story, and I just looked this up, Katrina actually has tuberculosis, which is why she's up there anyway, because the Swiss was renowned for having these clinics where you could sit out in the dry air and hope that your lungs would get better. 
Yeah, and that's something that as a modern reader in 2022, a lot of contemporaries that, that were written anytime prior to World War II, you had a lot of rich people going off to sanitariums in Switzerland to treat their tuberculosis or to treat whatever ailments they have because that high, dry air was supposed to be really good for you. Who does that today? No, we don't have to because we have drugs that take care of that. But exactly. that was a real problem. Conan Doyle's wife, first wife, suffered from tuberculosis for a lot of years. And that's why he would end up in Switzerland, which is where he encountered the Reichenbach Falls that led to Sherlock Holmes Sherlock being Holmes shoved over and then, re- then over it. and then coming back and, you know, um, presaging what happens with Marvel heroes, which is those people never die. But here at the end, Katrina is simply convinced that she had been manipulated by the doctor and therefore she can just break free which i think is kind of a weaker version i think that's a little bit weaker than the tuberculosis i do but i could also kind of see that she's torn she fell in love with ted williams but she lied to him about who she was see ted williams boy chauffeur could marry a a A lady's lady's maid, maid but he can't marry a famous ballerina who travels around the world and what's he going to do stand there at the stage door holding her coat <laughs> holding and, her tutu <laughs> and having actually seen this in action in our own family it just doesn't work and so if katrina really wants to be the fabulous ballerina what does she do about ed williams does she visit him occasionally you know and and ballerinas it's an enormous amount of work to be a ballerina to, to be dancing around the world the practicing the weight control You can't be pregnant or having children and still be a ballerina. I don't think that really works out very well. (laughs) Well, and that's why it worked in the story, because she had tuberculosis. And Poirot says, you know, live your life while you can, and he will take care of you. He deeply loves you and wants to take care of you. And you can even father children. You can even have children, you know, until you get too sick. And they, in between his strength and your beauty, they would be gods and goddesses. Oh, yeah. Ted Williams is described (laughs) as being almost, you know, one of those incredible he won the genetic lottery he's incredibly good looking a greek god and it turns out in the short story the arcadian deer that katrina is a fake name too but her father was actually a lorry driver from like (laughs) manchester or someplace like that but she was gifted by the genetic lottery just like ted she was beautiful but she could dance she had that grace where she moved like a deer and not like a woman Mm -hmm. just astonishing grace So she realizes that she is not crazy, that she is not sick. She's being used and she decides that she's not going to be a ballerina anymore. And she goes to meet Ted in front of the fountain at uh, Scion House Conservatory. And you know they're getting their happy ever after. But before that, of course, was the climax, which I have to admit, I burst out laughing because as Poirot is going through and, you know, we've had long Poirots, which is the trope of him walking around and accusing everybody and telling the story. We've had ones where it was just like, can you get on with this? Can you just go ahead and tell us who did it? This one, because there's so many threads to pull together, held the interest until the very end when you have three people pulling out guns at the same time and pointing (laughs) them at each other. And you're thinking, wait a minute. This is Didn't we Europe. see this in Deadpool? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we saw this in Deadpool. <laughs> everybody had guns. <laughs> And yes, everybody did have a gun. We actually got two tropes in one here. Another major trope, and that is, this is this uh, dates all the way back to Sherlock Holmes, turning back to um, Conan Doyle again, the dog that didn't bark in the night. Remember, folks. Dogs don't lie. They're not people. They don't lie. If your mistress is attacked and you're any kind of a dog at all, particularly a dog who has already proven himself to be a yappy little ankle biter. Like the pug. Like the pug. If you're any kind of a dog at all and someone comes in and tries to rape your mistress. Because it intimates that apparently the, 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 the it was a man. She could tell it was a man because <laughs> he wasn't wearing any clothes except he was wearing shoes. Well, or he had his, his zipper or, undone. He had a zipper uh, undone. Uh, that's true. They didn't say specifically <laughs> they that. Didn't, so. they, were, they, didn't, they were very tasteful about this. But the dog didn't bark. Why didn't the dog bark? The dog didn't bark for one of two reasons. He already knew who this person was, or there was no such person, and it was just a story. And Poirot realizes this. 
just like Poirot realizes that dog doesn't bark at Dr. Lutz. Now, why does the dog not bark at Dr. Lutz when the dog barks at everybody? The dog already knows Dr. Lutz. How does the dog know Dr. Lutz? Because Dr. Lutz is actually the fence for Maracond. And so, yes, folks, Alice Cunningham is Maracond. And this proves that Countess Vera was right, that her daughter would either be straight and narrow or more evil than is possible. And she is. And this leads me back to the very ending. Countess Vera is crying out to Poirot, why can't you save my daughter? Why can't you let my daughter go? You let me go. And he just looks at her and the camera pulls away. And then it's off to Scion House and the joyful reuniting of Ted and Katrina. Well, and this is where fair. Poirot should have fair. said, you never killed anybody. Remember, we know because we have seen it on screen that Mariscon killed at least three people, a policeman, a policewoman, Lady Lucinda, whom she disemboweled in 30 seconds, and the hotel waiter, Robert, who was hung. And she was involved in that, too. She is a mass murderer, and she does it without any compunction whatsoever, without so much as a quiver of hesitation, because people to her are not real. Poirot does not say to Countess Vera, which he should have, she is a murderer or something along the lines of you never killed anyone. There is a difference between being a jewel thief and murdering people. And what's more, Maricon takes pleasure in it. She yeah. makes it last. And this is where I, I say he doesn't need to say this. There's yes, some things does. that just hasn't have to be said because when in the walk afterward or even in the moment, people are going to say, are you fucking kidding me? Really? And Poirot essentially doesn't have to. And this is where Countess uh, Rosakoff <laughs> in this weird way kind of breaks it off because she has this weird line about, Oh, you and I, when, if we were together, we would set the world on fire. And all I can love. think is, why like, would you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> think of the devastation. If you've ever done home renovation under normal circumstances, you know how frustrating and irritating and time consuming and expensive it is. Now burn your house to the ground and have a tornado go past. And so every other house in the neighborhood is gone. Oh, look, there's New Orleans. <laughs> The entire Gulf Coast after a bad hurricane season, and it takes decades to put things back together. And you want to burn the world down? I don't think so. We've talked about this before, about Poirot's character and how he's a sad man because he... He chose, he, he chose this life. He chose this life. He chose this life. And sometimes he sees family life and families and children and wish that he could have that as well. But of course, he doesn't do anything because he really doesn't want to, I think. Or he's also a prisoner of his OCD. Yeah, he really doesn't want to. I but just I, can't see him having an infant, a little squalling infant pissing on him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Which I could. That do. would be very funny, but I just couldn't see him accepting that. And yeah, he knows it. But and he the, knows it. Yeah, exactly. But sometimes, you know, this in this life, you make your compromises and you bite the bullet and give up a part of your autonomy in favor of something much better. And, and clearly he made the wrong choice as far as I'm concerned. But well, I'm not Poirot. It, well, I, I don't think that he did because he did a job that nobody else could do. And Poirot, you know, solved all kinds of crimes. He put brought all kinds of criminals of various, you know, from jewel thieves up to mass murderers to justice, something that would not otherwise have happened. He made sure that justice was done. And that is a very important thing to do. But I still think he should have reminded Countess Vera, who is apparently really she she acts like she's not blind to her daughter, but she is. You never murdered anybody. And why would Countess Vera think that pickpocketing, which she does, by the way, during this episode, she steals Mrs. Rice's brooch because she wants it. She can't stop herself. But, you know, there's a difference between pickpocketing and disemboweling people. <laughs> there really is. And she's not seeing it. Maybe because she's seeing her daughter being hustled off by the police where she's going to face trial and they can only hang you once, but they're going to make sure that they do it. But I, I certainly hope so, especially after there's this long scene in which Alice is taunting Poirot about, oh, you you think you're so good, but I'm so much better than this. Yeah, you kind of really wanted to say, well, uh, get the rope. Let's just go ahead and hang her now. <laughs> I mean, I'm, just to shut her up. <laughs> 
it really was a good episode. I really enjoyed it. It was so much better than it could have been. And there have been in the Poirot series, there have been some real bow wows. I am looking at you, appointment with death with white slaving <laughs> nuns. <laughs> <laughs> Which was terrible, or even worse, the murder of Roger Ackroyd, where they oh. took a perfectly wonderful story and destroyed it. But they really did a good job with this one. This was especially important in the series because after this, we're going to have another episode. We're going to have the last episode in the Poirot series curtain Curtain. and then boy is that going to be a sob fest i'm sure it will be because once and again what's going to be really interesting about curtain is that uh, agatha wrote this near the height of her powers in about 1941 1942 because she wanted to make sure that there was a nest egg for the family if she was killed in the blitz once again she turned things upside down she did things with the tropes that you would have never expected and i'm looking forward to seeing it it should be a wonderful show and i hope you'll join us uh when we do the podcast afterwards and of course we'll have it on our instagram feed and i'll review it and but it'll be the last poirot and there is a difference between seeing poirot from 1997 you know 1993 almost 20 years 19 oh, 19, so 20 years seeing these episodes stretched out over 20 years and seeing them concentrated right, twice less a week than a year. <laughs> in less than a year they, you get a very different um opinion about the episodes and poirot himself as well so yeah, hopefully and- we convey some of that to you they really did a good job with labors. So I was really pleased. The one that we just saw, uh, the big four, again, they did a really excellent job, which is strange because, see, we've been watching them out of sequence. And so we did see Dead Man's Folly. And I didn't like that one as much because we spent far too much time watching Poirot traipsing through the rhododendrons and not enough time on the plot and especially not enough time on doing justice to old Murdell and Marlene Tucker and their family. But then they're peasants. And so I guess they don't get any justice. Maybe that's why Poirot (laughs) feels guilty sometimes (laughs) because he should. So we'll see you again next time. Here on Agatha Christie, she watched. This is Bill Peschel and Teresa Peschel, and we'll see you at the movies. Agatha Christie, she watched. Is Teresa Peschel and Bill Peschel produced by Bill Peschel? Theme song, Call to Adventure by Kevin McLeod. New episodes come out every week wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm backslash mystery and leaving a five star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on Mystery She Watched, email Peschel at peschelpress.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to peschel at peschelpress.com. And thank you for listening.